Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I am a board member for the USA chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. And I'm also the founder of a company called Humanist Learning Systems. We are the education partner for this series, the Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. My co-host today is Elizabeth Castillo. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Castillo out at Arizona State University um, and also Secretary of the International Humanistic Management Association. Yay. Our guest today is Dr. Afsana Nahav nah Nahavandi. Did I get it right? Nahavandi? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Nahavandi is a professor of management at the University of San Diego and Professor Emeretta at Arizona State University. She is the founder and principal of the Cultural Mindset Project and the Individual Cultural Mindset Inventory. Originally from Iran, Dr. Nahavandi is multilingual and has a broad and diverse cross-cultural background. Her expertise and experience have made her a sought-after speaker, consultant, and trainer in the areas of cultural culture and leadership development to public and non-profit organizations and companies. Dr. Nahavandi's book, The Art and Science of Leadership, was published by Pearson and currently is in its seventh edition. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you for the introduction. It's always so weird to sit here and have people talk about you. It's kind of a weird experience. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm so glad you could join in. I look forward to this. Uh, for some of you, it's noon and it's lunchtime. For me, I, it's breakfast time, almost late breakfast time in California. It's a pleasure being with you today. I, um, you're here because you already have an interest in or you work in the area of culture and diversity and inclusion. Um, you already are part of the choir, most likely. And if you're not, maybe I will make you more part of the choir and have you join us at the end of this talk. I would like to talk to you about the way I approach teaching and practicing diversity and cultural um, management. I teach leadership, I teach cross-cultural management here at USD. So my focus is on organizations, but the focus is really kind of relevant across any group of people who work together, so any organization. So we'll talk about this unique approach that uh, both helps us understand and maybe include culture in the way we make decisions as leaders, followers, team members. Before we kind of dig into the matter, the matter itself, I want you to do a visualization. If you're driving, don't close your eyes. Uh, but if you're not driving, you can close your eyes for a minute. <laughs> and I want you to visualize several things that I'm going to talk to you about. So think about doing your last minute Thanksgiving shopping at the grocery store, um, and you're waiting in a long line. Ahead of you is a young couple talking about having just returned from their honeymoon in Hawaii. Behind you are two firefighters with a cartload of water and snacks. As you get closer to the counter, you browse the magazine shelf and the latest issue of Fortune magazine has the picture of the winner of this year's most creative entrepreneur. You are almost there. Two little kids are sitting in the car arguing with their parent over the candy they want to buy, and they are delaying everybody's checkout process. You finally get done, you're shopping and you're in your car and a landscaping truck is blocking your exit and your way home with the driver enthusiastically engaged in a conversation with someone trimming trees. Okay, open your eyes. If you saw, so didn't let me kind of check to see what you saw in your visualization. Did you see two men talking about their honeymoon? Two female firefighters doing the food run? A young black woman on the cover of Fortune magazine? A dad struggling with his kids? How about the driver, a white surfer dude, I'm from California here in San Diego, talking in English to his coworker who's up on the tree? If you didn't see these, if you saw a Hispanic driver to a mixed gender couple, a male or maybe an Asian male on the cover of Fortune magazine, the dad and two buff men being the firefighters, you have just used your culture as the filter through which you see the world. This is what the cultural mindset is. There's nothing wrong. You can call it any isms, you're sexist, you're racist. It, it's not a matter of ism. It's a matter of how we have been trained by our culture. We have learned to see the world in a certain way. 
And that's what the cultural mindset helps you kind of attain, achieve, and understand. It isn't biological. It isn't something you're born with. It isn't in your genes. We know from anthropology that race is fundamentally meaningless. It is an incredibly important social construct, but it is not a construct that has any real biological meaning. Culture is something you learn. Culture is something that changes. Culture is something that you learn very early, but it also provides all of us with the meta context. And the meta context means two things. One is it means that it provides you with a background, a filter, kind of the picture that runs in the background as meta. It also means in old Roman terms, it's the guidepost around a track that helped the racers get around the track. So culture not only provides you with the background and the filter to your world, which is what you just did when you visualized, but then it also helps you decide what behaviors are right or wrong. It helps you decide what to do. Do you look somebody in the eye? Do you shake their hands? Do you smile a lot? Do you not smile? Those are all cultural. They might have something to do with your personality, of course, but our culture has kind of is running always in the background as this meta context that influences what we do. Culture is this complex set of values, beliefs um, that we learned early in our lives that we share with a member, with, with a group, and that makes that group unique. It is also simply the way in which any group of people, now this could be at the national level, at an ethnic group level, it could be regional. It's the way any group of people have developed rules and regulations and beliefs that help them navigate the world, make sense of the world and validate what's going on out there. Without culture, we are often, well not often, we are lost. We have seen around the world the impact of destroying cultures has had on the members of that group. We've done it to native uh, communities in the new world, if you would like to call it that, a very difficult, different, weird name, but the new world. Um, we've seen the effect all over the world when organ people are prevented from exercising and relying on their culture. It has devastating effects. So culture is something that we use actively. Um, it is interesting because you need to pick, we, most of us kind of define what our culture is. Um, you may use your nationality, your passport, and in some cases, your passport may not mean a whole lot. You might rely on your gender and sexual identity as the primary culture. You might rely on your region. Are you Californian? Are you Eastern? Are you Western? Are you, where are you from? Um, you might rely on your profession. If you're a person of faith, that might be a key factor for you in how you define your culture. So it's an interesting thing that sometimes when I do these workshops, we don't have an opportunity to interact as much here. People will tell me, well, I don't really have culture. And what they're thinking about is, well, culture is something that's about exotic, different people. And it's a, actually a very common thing. And so, well, you know, my culture, and they often say it in a very self-deprecating ways, I don't really have culture. We all have culture at multiple levels. Um, we also often feel how our culture impacts us when people mislabel us. I'll give you a quick anecdote that happened to me years ago. I had a dean I was working with, I was a director of the MBA program at the, the West Campus of where Elizabeth is at ASU. And the dean that I worked with, when they walked into my office, we had had some disagreements. And he said, you know, for a Middle Eastern Muslim woman, you are really outspoken. This was a few years ago. It was maybe a little bit more acceptable to make comments like that than it is now. Now it would be, probably he wouldn't say that. But the funny part was for me, it was like, okay, he got one of these right. The woman part. Um, I don't consider myself Middle Eastern because I consider myself Iranian and that's a whole other discussion. Um, I've never practiced Islam. My family is by culture, I guess, Muslim, but I, that's not part of my identity. But clearly the cultural identity he was assigning to me was what was driving his meta context about what I should be doing and what he was expecting of me, to be quiet. I went to a French school. I'm not Muslim. I'm from a very strong matriarch or family. I'm outspoken and loud. Um, I didn't fit. So we often see the impact of culture when people mislabel us in one way or another. So it's really important that um, we understand our own culture as meta context. So um, the typical way 
that cultural training, cultural competence, diversity and inclusion is approached um, is by focusing on the other culture. What I propose and what I've been doing for the past few years that seems to work is to focus on culture as kind of a multi-level thing. I also talk often about what I call the cultural paradox. The rules of one world do not apply to other worlds. And that's something that most of us can't realize until we understand what the rules of our own world is. What works in this country, what works in your region, what works in your community has probably worked really well, which is why you're using it. In terms of how you interact with people, what's right and what's wrong. You take that outside of your small world and every world is small. It is likely not to make as much sense and it is likely to lead to some mistakes. So this issue of how your culture as meta context creates a paradox is something that I'd like you to keep in mind. So when we typically teach and talk about culture and diversity, and, and I do more cross-cultural training, um, I do fewer diversity work. And when I do, I like to have a partner who has different cultural identities. I love to work with a, either an African-American or Hispanic, because then we have kind of a more complete set, if you will. But um, very often, Teaching diversity involves two things. And most of us in an hour that when we do our training and our workshops and our teaching don't have time to get to all of that. But it involves knowing the history, the social issues and their impact. And that's the stuff that's become controversial these days. Do we teach critical race theory? By the way, like many others, I had no idea what that was until a couple of years ago when I started researching this book. This is not a common thing that many of us teach, but you know, issues of how do we teach the good, the bad, the beautiful, the not so beautiful part of a history that influenced people's cultural values. That's the historical part. And that's often become the challenging part. The other part of teaching and training people in DEI is understanding culture and then developing that cultural mindset. You can do these separately. Um, very often I do, but they really complement one another. So if you are able to do provide people with the historical background, with the context, as well as the understanding of culture and how it operates, then you really start having some impact on people. I have approached it um, by focusing on three things. So for me, the cultural mindset, let me give you a formal definition, is a way of thinking and a frame of mind and a frame of reference that considers culture as a factor when assessing yourself, and assessing others and situations and in making decisions and acting on them. So having a cultural mindset doesn't mean that you know about the 10,000 plus cultures in the world. That's not a possibility. It does not mean that you know everything, every language, or that you have all the details about everybody else. But it does mean that when you approach a situation, you think about there is the culture running in the background as meta context. What role might it play? Could this have a cultural element that I need to consider. Some cases it's obvious, in some cases it's not so obvious, and in some cases it's not that relevant. Um, so that's what having a cultural mindset for me is. It's not knowledge of everything, it's not just competence, but it is running culture in the back of your mind and being aware of what it means. As you're thinking about developing and thinking about whether you have the cultural mindset, there are three levels, and the first one is the hard one that many of us ignore, and I think many of the trainings that we do ignore. First one is understanding your own. Spending a lot of time saying, what are my cultures? And I'm using the plural term. What is their impact? What values do I come in? What is that background that runs that makes me think when they say a couple returning from their honeymoon, male, female, rather than two men? What is it that makes me think, oh, landscaper, Hispanic, most likely. Understanding these. That also means that we start understanding our implicit bias. There are many ways we can do that. The Harvard project has done a great job there, but that involves really understanding your own culture. What is it that I value? What is it that I like? It also involves having, and I hope all of us do, I certainly do, I have plenty of cultural pride in my multiple cultures, having cultural pride, understanding, hey, I like where I'm from. I like what my parents have taught me. I value who I am but I also does not mean that I feel superior to. So you can have pride in your own culture without a sense of superiority. Tiny bit maybe, yes, of course it's better for me, but every culture has developed in the world because it allows people who are part of it 
to function and succeed. So culture justice, understanding your own culture allows you to do that basic work, spending some time knowing what is it that I am? Who am I? We always ask people, what are you? Um, well, what am I? <laughs> what is it that I am? So that's the first level. Um, that's the think part that allows you to understand your biases, your approaches, and we all have biases. There is no such thing as an unbiased processing of information. The second level is actually a little bit easier. It takes time, but it's a little bit easier. This is understanding other cultures and using variety of models, depending on which industry you're part of, which um, what your interest is, to just learn about other cultures. That's the part where you could travel, you could read. I teach cross-cultural management. There are terrific models of leadership across cultures that I teach my students and I do training with. So that's the second one. And then the third level is what we often focus on, which is what we call cultural competencies. Do I bow, kiss, or shake hands when I meet someone? Um, do I smile? Do I not smile? Am I, when I meet a Muslim woman, can I extend my hand or not? These are basic skills. Um, they're very nicely targeted. So if you're traveling somewhere, if you're working with a multicultural group and you're aware of their culture, that's what you can focus on. But without having done the work at the basic level of understanding yourself, you can't learn 10,000 cultures. There is no way. But if you learn your own, you can take a cultural mindset and step back. So the whole point of having a cultural mindset is understanding the role of culture as meta context, and then thinking about culture, your own and that of others, not just focusing on the facts and the competencies. That will allow you to work across cultures in a much more effective way. And if you pair that with teaching the history and understanding the history and social events, for us, it's immigration and slavery, and those are key issues. If you live in Europe, you need to understand colonialism. Slavery is not as much of an issue there, obviously, but colonialism is a huge powerful force. So understanding the background of culture in terms of history is important. And then doing the work from the individual point of view is also complementary. and the two go together. You can do them separately, but they go together. So Jennifer, I promised I would not ramble on for 25 minutes. So here I you am. You did awesome. All right. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you. So it was really deep though. And I have a feeling that everybody who listened to that probably is bringing in their own knowledge base to how they're understanding it. And I was just thinking of conversation I had with a brain scientist about a month ago about how brains learn and are basically pattern, rec our neocortex is basically pattern recognition. That's what it does. And the brain really likes it when it recognizes a pattern and it really doesn't like it when it doesn't recognize the pattern. And it, you're, there's this idea of cultural mindset where like maybe that's the problem why people have so much trouble with it is it can be almost physically painful for some people to have a pattern show up that defies their expectations, right? And that's what's happening a lot of times with culture. It's not that one is good or bad, it's, it's, it's that it's different. <laughs> so, and, and different means danger. That's also part of our biology. Yeah. Familiar so. is safe, different is danger. And again, people say, oh, I'm not biased. I'm not, it's not, we are all biased. This is how our world functions. This is how our brain functions. <laughs> we recognize patterns, we like them, or we are afraid of what's, automatically when something is new, our brain goes, oh, danger, danger, fight, right. fight or flight, fight or flight. Right. If you're not aware of that, you're going to either ignore what the danger is or fight it. But if you know this is what's going on, if you know, oh, I'm seeing this through my own cultural lens, nothing wrong with that. What is the different one? Is, there is a different one here. So let's talk, understand, interact to see if I can understand and stop reacting in that, oh my gosh, pattern. I don't like it. This is not something I know. Right. So one of the questions we got early on, um, as people wrote things, they said, do you consider social class to be a form of culture? And I think the answer is obviously yes, but if you can expand on that. <laughs> yeah. So we often talk about kind of primary and secondary levels of the culture or diversity. So the primary levels are things you cannot typically change about yourself. Um, you can change your gender, but, you know, typically gender or what's assigned to you as race is not changeable, but there are a whole bunch of secondary dimensions of diversity, education, social class, religion, marital status that are incredibly relevant. 
and that's where I think the work for individuals is important. You need to understand which one of your cultures are important to you. Is social class something that matters to you? And if you say absolutely not, you need to think twice. It always matters. <laughs> the whole, all over the world, it does matter. But you know, your gender might be a key issue. Your sexual identity, gender identity might be a key issue for you. And then understanding that what may matter to you may not be what matters to others. Um, we know from research on culture that skin color, colorism is a huge factor. People pay attention to two things that we know we call master class and like a master status in psychology and cognitive psychology. One is skin color, the other one is gender. Those are the two things that people see and they automatically react and categorize others based on those two. Um, everywhere around the world, skin color has a status associated with it. And that's something that we, you know, we need to recognize it. We need to, we, it is silly, it is illogical, but it exists. And it's in India, it's in Brazil, it's in Europe, it's in Asia, it's in this country. So you may not see yourself as a black woman. People will see you first as a black woman. Uh, so, you know, understanding these patterns and knowing that, okay, I, that's going to operate in the back of my mind. I need to stop it. I need to stop it and pay attention to what's more relevant. If you are not aware of that, you can't, you can't do it. You know, just like you can, then you get defenses like, oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not racist. Like, no, this has nothing to do with racism <laughs> in the sense of willingly hurting and seeing others as inferior. And you know, if you want to define racism as that. Um, so I had another question that kind of dovetails on that, and that is um, that, you know, it has to do with race. Um, you brought it up and it just made me think as I was looking at this question, how do you navigate having genuine curiosity and asking questions versus asking something that might be offensive? Yeah, yeah it, and you can't learn if you don't ask and you can't learn if you fail, if you don't fail, right? Um, ask away and and practice how to ask i i'm curious about people's culture and it's it's just because i'm curious and i'm nosy so i will introduce myself i you know i'll tell people i'm from iran originally i'm really invested in this thing i'm interested where are you from so i will couch it in a way that helps people you know or i will often say you know i look white I am white by some definitions and I'm not white by others. So can we talk about this? Because I'm really interested in where you're from. Um, or simple, asking about people's cultures, like, how do you do this? This is how my family has done it. This is what I've learned. So introducing it with a sense of, let me tell you a minute about myself and doing just a brief introduction rather than saying, so what are you? I mean, I get this question of what are you? I'm a human. <laughs> you know, I get honorary people say, so where are you from? I'm from California. No, where are you from? I'm not from Arizona. I was there 26. And then, you know, they said, and then I, I know exactly what they're looking for. You have a little accent. You don't look very kind of American, maybe. I, I'll play with them if they, they kind of are mean to me. <laughs> I'll keep going. It's like, no, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Georgia. I'm like, no, no, no. Where are you from? Oh, no, no, but where are your family? Oh, so you can play, you can get nasty about this, or you can be gracious and say, I'm going to ask you a question. It sounds like I'm I, I'm really interested because of what I'm trying to learn. I'm I have found certainly internationally people love to tell you about themselves, love to tell you about their culture, and within this country, when you approach it with a little bit of humility, people are happy to talk. Um, people are happy to share. So that that's the way I've approached it. That it's it's not yet hit me in the face yet. <laughs> it probably will one day, but so far I've, I've been successful at doing that. Perfect. I guess, you know, how do you recover from the faux pas? Oh, because God. everybody has the faux pas. Everybody <laughs> has the faux pas all the time. Um, you apologize, not, I'm sorry I offended you, but I'm really sorry I did not intend this to happen. I am very sorry. And with some humor, um, and just if it doesn't, if it's not accepted, you take it as a learning opportunity and you move on. We make mistakes. Um, we are all going to make mistakes. I had a colleague recently who was teaching 
a class and he's from South America and he was talking about exactly this issue of race being a non-issue. It should, it, it doesn't exist. A human race is a human race and how our physical characteristics impact or uh, have an undue impact on how we describe people. And he said, for example, and he pointed to his eyes. He said, for example, when you, you know, the Chinese, and he pointed to his eye, have eyes that are in different shapes. And he was explaining this as it's irrelevant. He had two Chinese students from China and two Chinese American students. The two Chinese American students were deeply offended by him pointing to his eye. The two Chinese students came to him and said, yeah, our eyes are shaped differently. Yours are weird. Yours are round, ours are long. Why is this offensive? He apologized. He was teaching a class on culture. He apologized. The two Chinese American women eventually accepted his apology, but they were offended. And he did, you know, he was just using that and he said, oh my gosh, I've learned. This is not acceptable. I need to not, you know, this is just, you learn, you learn. But the same behavior from the same quote unquote towards the same race offended one group and didn't offend the other. You're likely to make mistakes. You're likely to make mistakes and hopefully people around you are gracious enough to accept an apology. And if you're sincere enough, deliver it. And sometimes you just have to say, I, I screwed up. I screwed up. This was offensive. I screwed up. Um, most of us, if we're slightly aware of it, are not likely to be that bad. But you know, it still might happen. Humor is great. I, I laugh a lot at myself. Um, I'm terrible with, I don't know Africa as well as I should. And I've done some work with African um, entrepreneurs when I was at, at USD. We had some programs. You know, I've I screwed up <laughs> very often. I don't know the countries well as much as I've tried. It, it is like I could not possibly bring up myself. And I smile and I say, I'm sorry. I have a lot to learn about your continent. So you're going to help me. And they're great. They were great. I'm like, okay, yeah, let me tell you. This is different. We don't like Nigerians and they don't like Kenyans. I'm like, okay, good. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> Um, I think that comes back to your statement that you can't learn 10,000 different cultures. Yeah, All you can be is open to the fact of you don't know what the culture is necessarily. Exactly. So Elizabeth, did you want to, I know we, I can see we're getting questions in the chat room. So yeah, thank you to everyone for posting questions and keep them coming. I'm going to go ahead and start off with a few. Um, Terrence um, asks or notes, I guess, having a cultural mindset seems very akin to having a, a good humane mindset. And maybe could you talk about the parallels between humanism or and, um, and uh, the cultural mindset? Sure. Um, so you have to help me to help define humanism because I think I know what it is, but maybe I don't know as well as those of you who are part of this organization. Give me a quick definition. Jen, you wanna take that one? Sure, so the American Humanist Association defines it as a progressive philosophy of life that uh, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. But for me as a practicing humanist, it's a reminder to remind myself that the other person is a full-fledged human who's not me and their brain is different and they're not me. And that they might have different experiences that I know nothing about when I'm interacting with them, which makes me think in your terms, I'd have a cultural mindset. Just It's just having a cultural mindset. I think I need to join your organization. I, I, I like that. This is very cool. Um, I think there are a lot of... Um, similarities in that, you know, exactly as you said, is understanding that something works for me, that this is my culture, this is who I am, but you are different and equally invested and equally proud of your own cultural background. And that does not make me better. When we look at cultures around the world, there are some points in time when it looks like a country or a culture is more successful than others but it's relative, it depends on the criteria you use. So human beings are human beings, cultures are cultures. So in that sense, I think there's very much of an equivalent of not ranking, not saying one is superior to another, but that we all are there and our cultures have developed as a way of allowing us to make sense of the world and validate our experiences. And we have to, we, you know, we live in a world where, not that it ever was not global. I think we've always had interaction across different cultural groups. Um, people have always traveled, traders have always traded, but we are so in contact with people who are not like us. And we assume because of globalization, I just had a long discussion with my MBA students a couple of nights ago. 
well, globalization has made everybody the same. It has not. Regional differences are very much there. People very much are invested in their culture and their differences and their uniqueness. So although we see them much more and we may speak more English, all of us, that does not make people the same. And their uniqueness is what makes our world rich and wonderful. I hate it when I go to countries and all you see is H&M across the street rather than any interesting store, any interesting local. But, you know, the globalization has had an impact, but it has not changed the fact that people are invested in their groups and their uniqueness. And that makes us all better. Um, so very much, I think, the cultural mindset in terms of respect of other and understanding and kind of culture just is. Understand it, learn it, accept it. Um, and having a multicultural point of view means that you know that there are the cultures out there and you know that they're all can contribute in one way or another, even if you don't know what that contribution might be. One of the themes that we explore a lot here is um, dignity, you know, is kind of being the, the universal. And it sounds like that's, you know, at the heart of what you're getting, what, whatever lens you're filtering through, as long as you keep the dignity and respect in mind, that's yeah. the core. Um, so now I'm going to move on to Rosalind's question, who is quite a provocative. So uh, Austin, I hope you're ready. Um, how do you differentiate between culture and identity? Uh, one, oh, that, gosh, I think one part of your identity is your culture. So we often talk about your cultural identity having developed. There are aspects of your culture, uh, of your identity that may not be related to culture, but I can't imagine any part of it not being. I guess there are parts of your identity that are related to your personality, but if your identity is based on your sexuality, your region, your national, I mean, those are all cultural factors, right? I'm a culture person. I think culture is everything. And I have colleagues who say, oh my gosh, it's not everything. Well, close. Um, but I think your identity is very much tied to your cultural backgrounds. And I mean plural. And we have multiple ones, whether it's your faith, whether it's your gender, whether it's your regional background. Um, it's hard to separate the two. I don't think we can talk about our identity outside of culture or exclude culture from our discussions of who we are. Um, and, and speaking of kind of the universal basics, um, you had mentioned about biology as being something that we're just wired and that's hard to transcend. So Tracy's question is, how do we raise people's awareness to prevent that fear of the unknown that does have biological roots? Yeah, you know, I mean, it, some of it is rationality. Um, uh, Paul Bloom, who's a psychologist, talks about racism, which or at least the, the idea of not liking others, as we were just talking, is wired into us. This is goes back to millen, you know, thousands and thousands of years when we were being chased by saber-toothed tigers. It is a matter of education. It is a matter of teaching people that that is not the reaction that is functional, necessary, and important in a global world. It's just not, there's no reason to fear the person next to you in a society, in a civil society. There just isn't. Now, doesn't mean that it's you're in the middle of the night and you're walking someplace, you should not say, oh, everybody's wonderful, but it is just a reaction. And that's from knowledge, that's from education. We know that we can teach people empathy um, through contact. You know, so I mean, with the typical things we do, little kids, the, the younger generation has fewer racial biases because they grew up with kids that are different from them. Our grandparents in this country often grew up in completely monocultural environments. If you never met somebody who is different from you, you're likely to be afraid. Uh, if you never learn about cultures, you're likely to be leery about it. Um, if all you are taught is, you're better, your culture is better. And every culture, by the way, thinks and knows they're better than everybody else. I mean, that's, you know, American exceptionalism, the Japanese are better, the Dutch are the cozy people, the, you know, so the Iranians have art, French have culture. I mean, it's just, it doesn't matter. Whatever culture you are, you have some degree of, I'm better than everybody else. Um, so it is a matter of education. It is a matter of our responsibility, my responsibility, and not just at university level, it's too late starting in schools and you know hopefully we are able to and parents obviously 
of not ignoring differences because I think that backfires very often. No, 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 we're all the same. Don't look at color, don't look. No, look at how different people are and look how wonderful that is. Yes, this person has darker skin color than you. Yes, person's hair is different. Their eyes are different. They have two mommies, they have two daddies. Um, if rather than say, no, don't talk about it, don't. And I think that's a reaction that many parents have is no, I don't want, I don't want my kid to be racist. I won't talk about uh, color. I won't talk about gender. I won't talk about race. We need to talk about how difference is there and it's reality and it's irrelevant. We're humans and we all have potential and we should see people for what they offer and what they can do for you and do for the society. Um, so we do have a lot of educators in the audience um, and they've gotten questions about, you know, hopefully it, it isn't too late, you know, when they come into college, how, how do you, you know, teach, what models do you use to teach this cultural mindset? Yeah, so uh, I, I often think that I'm kind of lucky not to be um, teaching in arts and sciences or history of political science, especially in this environment, it's such a challenge these days. So I'm kind of like, okay, I'm happy to be in a business school. I approach it with the cultural background. It's really hard to talk about internal diversity, race, gender issues. It's really easy to talk about national culture. Students love it, it's fun. So I start with that level. Um, I have an, often have different nationalities in the class. I start with the easy part. It's like, okay, let's talk about nationality. That's always fun. We can make fun of the French. They can make fun of the Italians. And so that part, we're okay because there is no power differential. It's kind of an equal power thing. And when we get to that, then I start, I use something by the way, that's the easiest tool in the world that's worked incredibly well for me. I have people first list the cultures they're part of and you know, kind of focus their attention on, okay, think about nationality, think about gender, ethnicity, race that are the obvious ones, but then do you have, you know, are you part of an athletic culture? Are you a theater kid? So I, I kind of talk about a whole bunch of, all your military kids. We have a lot of them in San Diego. Um, kind of explore the variety of levels of culture. So have them listed first. And then I have them start drawing circles, a Venn diagram of sorts and say, okay, which one's the biggest part? And then start intersecting them. And if they manage to intersect that little intersection of the various Venn, the Venn diagrams, is what makes that person unique. And it may be completely different or at least somewhat different from your sibling even because you may have different identities. Um, then that kind of removes this, oh, you are different from me. Well, you're multiple culture too. Having that self-awareness of culture for me has been one of the most effective ways of starting to talk about, okay, so this is who you are. Who's the person next to you? Um, it's been a really effective way for me to teach. And I start with an easy thing because once you make people defensive, they don't listen, uh, unfortunately. But you know, my, my technique has been also, let's talk about something that's easy and let's talk about your cultures. And then we share people, what are the values? Where do they come from? Why are they important to you? Which ones are important to you? Um, I use also the exercise of having people get up and get into different groups. So let's group by gender, let's group by religion, let's group by race, let's group by the music you like, let's group by the faith that you hold, uh, let's group by cat or dogs. I mean, I make it silly sometimes. Um, so people start moving around and I say, so which one is really you? And they go, I, I don't know. And it's again saying, okay, we focus on one or two it's easy to label, but we are all very complex in our view. So that those two have really worked for me in starting to break the ice of, okay, we can talk about this um, and then get to the more difficult ones. That's where having knowledge of history and the social issues related to our cultural backgrounds really would come in and would be important. I don't, I don't teach that stuff. I have them read some a little bit. Um, enough to get them thinking, um, but hopefully somebody else is doing the work there too, because that's essential. Can't, can't do one without the other. Well, that is fantastic, Afsani. Thank you so much, because we did have some questions about the experiential exercises, and so the, those are some great, great examples. Those two are great. Um, 
Avinash also um, raised a point, and so he said, uh, they say, as um, someone who immigrated from Africa, I make a lot of blunders in class that verge on cultural matters. Um, what's the best way that's helped me is to explain the fact in advance and inform students that I'm likely to make blunders as everyone else. Um, and this um, seems to, you know, set the stage where people are more forgiving. And um, can you talk about, you know, the, the importance of humility or curiosity, maybe that, that Avinash is getting to? Yeah, we're from in Africa, by the way. See, we say Africa. Africa is huge. <laughs> we tend to bunch everybody together. And it's one of the most multicultural. Uh, most of the countries in Africa are so multicultural. Anyway, I'm learning. Um, yeah, the being, you know, if you are faking your sense of humility, people will know. If you feel like you're better than everybody else, eventually it will seep through. So it starts with this thing is, I know a lot about cultures. There's a heck of a lot I don't know. And I introduce myself as, some, as, a, as a student of, rather than an expert of, um, that, that it, approaching people with questions rather than statements is huge. Approaching people with some humility of, I'm here to learn, I'm here to understand. Um, we are learning together, although I may have a role of facilitator or teacher or instructor or professor, we are learning together. It makes a huge difference. Nobody likes to be approached, even if, you know, nobody likes to be approached by the voice of God, unless it is the voice of God and you're hearing it. I don't have that voice to tell you what your world is supposed to be like. Um, and people shut down. So saying, hey, I, you know, I get tired, my accent starts going towards this weird mix of Persian and French. So my MBA class at 10 o'clock at night, here's a very different voice. <laughs> so just introducing yourself. But again, if you don't know yourself, you can't share that knowledge. And that's, I think, the work that many of us don't do. Um, um, so I'm going to move to some of the registration um, questions now because we've kind of exhausted the chat. So keep them coming if you have questions in the audience. But Tatiana, when she registered, she said, "What? How is the cultural mindset different than DEI work?" Yeah, it, I think it's one aspect. The DEI work depends, and we have so many different people who do this work that approach it differently. DEI work often focuses on understanding implicit bias and necessitates understanding the historical and social structures that we are living with. You can do the cultural mindset without that piece. Um, I think you can focus the cultural mindset on a very generic, what is culture and keep it very separate. I think it, it's much richer when you do both depending on your the cultural setting you're working in. So they go hand in hand. I think DEI is much more specific in terms of what is targeting. Um, and it's much more specific to organizational practices or implicit bias within a certain um, environment. This cultural mindset is a broad view. It's kind of an overall view of how do we approach people with who are different from us. And you know, that's most of the world, everybody's different. Um, is this something that leaders and organizations can help um, develop? Um, and for example, the your colleague on the West Campus, who um, like, how might you coach him if you were helping him to, you know, rethink his way of relating to people? Yeah, you know, again, that was a while back. I didn't even react to all the weird things. It sounds really weird these days to say something like that. He, I'm not sure he would have said it. You know, if if somebody said something like that to me right now, I. I approach it with a nice smile, um, which is not that happy smile, but I approach it with a smile and I, I'm, I'm pretty straightforward. It's like, I know you don't mean to be offensive, but this is really kind of hurtful um, because you're putting me in a box. So I tend to be pretty direct in terms of approaching that. Um, the work that I do with um, executives often involves starting, you know, I mean, if they, if they have made the step to engage in this, they either were told they need to, hopefully they are also have some personal interest in learning. But I tend to be pretty direct with people saying, you know, I've met you and you've mentioned Iran and the nuclear problem five times. I haven't lived there in 40 years. That's not, why are you? And they go, oh, that's not what I mean. It's like, yeah, but you know, that's what it sounds like. So it's not that pleasant. <laughs> um, I tend to be pretty direct in terms of approaching those issues. Um, but I do it with a smile, try to be nice. 
you know, defensive people don't learn. <laughs> Um, just real quick, everyone, my company, Humanist Learning Systems, is the learning partner for this session. If you were looking for an HRCI, SHRM, or a, gen a general certificate of completion, now is the time to message me in chat. I need your name, your first name, your last name, your email, and which certificates you want. You can get more than one. And again, it's HRCI, SHRM, and general. Uh, approve. So that's what I need. Um, Afsana, I wanted to kind of follow up on what Elizabeth just asked you, but um, going back to the question before that, that had to do with diversity and inclusion training. And that is part of the world I do. I do EEO and um, workplace harassment, which is uh, you know one of the obstacles to creating in inclusive work groups. And it dawns on me that, and I also offer like implicit bias training, right? Um, one, it dawns on me though that approaching diversity as a cultural mindset exercise might make it more acceptable and interesting to the participants than if it's a diversity or implicit bias training. And the reason I think that is because the holy grail, right, is to create a cohesive work group an exactly. inclusive, cohesive work group. So the challenge is how do we create inclusion? And I do think conversations about personal culture uh, facilitates that learning and that openness and finding where the overlaps are and where the differences are that might help a team actually become inclusive. You know, I, you see, you say diversity training, you have half the people say it's about time and half the people go, oh God, not again. You know, I, I, I'm tired of feeling guilty. It's like, no, this is not about guilt and talking about we all have bias. Take the implicit bias test online before you come to this training. Pick whichever you want. They're like, I don't know how many different options. We all have bias. This is not, it's just that how do you, are you aware of it? Are you using it? How is it reflecting itself in the workplace? People who are defensive and some people deserve to be defensive. I mean, they're clearly, but by and large, there are few people who deeply believe and are willing to say that one race and one group is unequal. And I mean, that, that's what racism is for me. So labeling people, even if they deserve it, is not gonna be productive. Um, this talking about your culture is interesting and hopefully it's just inching towards making them aware that Okay, yes, this is not about other people. Diversity training is about you as much, about understanding where you come from and what is it that you might be bringing to the situation. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna move to a question that has to do with some a really relevant current event. Um, and, and so as uh, the, the global citizen, um, so how does like the global versus the nationalist versus a local mindset, and then how does that relate to, um, you know, environmental stewardship and sustainability? Do you see any parallels there? You know, I, I think I do. I, part of our, at least the culture is the way kind of anthropologists define it. One of the elements of cultural values that we often look at is relationship to nature. And there are some cultural groups that have a very dominating relationship with nature. Brazil, the, the European part of Brazil is one of them. The US has had that to some extent of nature is there for us to use. So that's kind of the dominating view of nature. And then you have cultures that are much more we live in harmony, the concept of feng shui, the, how the Japanese view the world of, we try to live in harmony. And then you have cultures where the human is sub, kind of submissive to nature. That cultural value, I think, has an impact in how any of the national cultures are approaching their relationship to the environment. Not that China that has a more um, coexisting has dealt with nature, you know, environmental issues better, but there is much more awareness of the native cultures in this country have always set, set kind of the living in harmony with rather than dominating culture. So as much as there is this issue of capitalism and profit and greed and, you know, efficiency and kind of that's driving our lack of sustainability, there are also underlying cultural values about what is our relationship to nature. And if you come from a cultural background where nature is there for humans to use, rather than we are stewards of nature, you're going to have some differences that are very deep 
rooted culture. And if people aren't aware of those, then they just are fighting at the surface level. Uh, we talk about culture having the surface level, the mid level and the deep level, that deep, what is your relationship to nature might be driving a lot of our decisions in different countries about how we address sustainability. And does it even matter? You know, Have you learned as a kid that it matters or nobody's ever talked to you about nature? And it's changing, but culture ch takes a long time to change. Um, well, Marty brings up a culture change that you might uh, be familiar with. Um, he said that um, teaching over 50 years um, started out in Germany where uh, people addressed him as Herr Professor um, and very respectful. And now um, students come to class late, have their cell phones, they're, you know, acting like this class is optional. And if you give them a bad grade, they'll take you to the dean. So how, how do you um, adjust culture shifts? I mean, that's one example, but it, 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 you've also covered many where you know what we think culture is today tomorrow may not be that same yeah generation is actually one of the cultural elements that you need to look at we have different values within generations and we talk about millennials and all the other ones gen z's yeah i mean i did yeah marty i feel your your pain i i've been there too now I've, now i have the benefit of having a difficult name which means they still call me professor because nobody's going to try to say my name so <laughs> um i have that advantage yeah, the, the generations have changed. And as frustrating as sometimes it might be, I've been teaching for 40 years. I keep thinking, you know, my job here is to move them from point A to point B. And what do I need to do to get them there? And before I ask them to adjust, I'm going to have to adjust. So my lectures are shorter. I use a lot of things that they, I just, I have had to work harder to get to connect with them. And as I no longer have teenagers myself, my, my, my daughters are grown up and now they make fun of Gen Z's. It's pretty funny to hear them say that. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I make a very conscious effort to watch shows that I don't enjoy, but I know that the, my students do. I listen to music that I don't particularly love. And sometimes I learn to love it because I've got to do the work. My job is to get them from A to B. And used to be that I could just lecture to them and maybe they got there, maybe they didn't. Now they just don't listen. As you know, as soon as you start lecturing, their eyes go down. Um, I have them do constant searches when I'm teaching on Google. You know, go look at this up. Go look at a picture of the person I'm talking about so that they're engaged with that rather than with their game. Um, their attention span is shorter than it used to be. Um, and that, I guess that's very parallel to the workplace. Um, Stephanie Van Dellen's here in the audience, and I know she studies, you know, millennial, hey, <laughs> millennials in the workplace, right? And so managers need to have this adaptive mindset. Yeah, I mean, all of us, all of us, you know, the, the generations aren't that different. Stephanie's research also showed that. She did a great dissertation on that. We're not as different as we think we are on some fundamental issues. But there are issues, you know, you, you approach people from different cultures in different ways, if you know what their culture is. Generation is no different. Um, to make a connection, you got to approach them in a way that helps them understand what they need to know. And, and while we're being personally flexible too, like how you've adapted your teaching strategy, that seems key to it. Yeah, it's a lot more work for me. <laughs> Um, I'm going to move to Lisa Brady's question. Um, she asked, has anyone heard of the tool Diversity Atlas by the nonprofit Cultural Infusion? Um, they took five years to develop a cultural diversity assessment that is very comprehensive and taps into unique values. Um, they just partnered with Amazon. Um, are you aware of that? Okay. No, I, I'll be humble here. I don't know. There's every time I teach people say, do you know that? Like, nope, there's something I don't know. Plenty. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. Um, you know, good tools are good tools. If there's good research behind them, use them and adapt and bring in some other stuff that works for you. Um, Lisa, maybe you could, if you have a link to any information on that, maybe you could drop it in the chat and then we can check it out and send it out to people afterwards. So um, Jen, do you have any questions? Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, no, at the moment, um, you know, I don't, I think it's been really, really interesting, you know, and, and very thought provoking for me because the different parts of what you're talking about and the different levels of culture that you're talking about, um, they all spur like 
different things <laughs> that's going on. Um, so I, I think it's just been really helpful for me um, to listen yeah. through this and, and listen yeah. to the questions people have. I think, um, you know, I come back to, I, I saw a bunch of questions come up about the diversity training though. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, yeah, and, and I know Marty's know, got his hand yeah. up. So. The quick thing about levels of culture, we have access to our own, obviously the visible levels what we call the iceberg, the top of the iceberg. We know our foods and traditions and whatever. We have access to our own values. Many of us don't even have access to the deep rooted cultural assumptions. When you're looking at other cultures, unless you are fully immersed and part of another culture, there is absolutely no way we can go beyond that kind of slightly above the waterline. You cannot access another culture's deep rooted values but you can understand, you can ask questions, you can help, you know, kind of get, so if you know you're gonna be working with a group, you get a mentor, you ask, you know, say specifically, hey, I, you know this group, I don't. Help me navigate the cultural aspects and help me be my coach, be my mentor, even if it's for just an hour, watch me in this meeting, tell me what I should do. Ask for help. And that's what also has to do with the humility, ask for help. Um, if I could get this through my, youngest daughter's head. She just started a PhD program, a new culture. Like ask for help. <laughs> People will help. And it's often like little things, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not yeah. even something you'd think to ask about. Yeah. And it, you're like, oh, well, and then someone tells you this, like I just found out about a month ago that the Islamic cultures tend to take Friday and Saturday off as opposed to Saturday and Sunday off, which completely explains why my Saudi Arabian clients are always emailing me on Sunday because yeah. it's their it, it's my Monday, you yeah, know. They are, they're good. they had their Friday off, <laughs> and I would have never thought to ask that question, right? Why well, you ask, and you you know the assumption is why are they not respecting my Sunday? But they are, they're respecting their own Sunday. <laughs> Um, I said, I think we're almost at a close. Marty has his hand up. Marty, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? And this will probably be the last one. Thank you, Elizabeth and Jennifer. Uh, I just uh, want to add to uh, what Asana just said. Uh, after so many years of teaching and moving from being idolized to now uh, being trashed in class all the time, I've decided to write more than to teach. And in writing, uh, I partnered with a co-author kind of following up on what she said, and that is this individual I'm co-authoring is half my age. She's a woman of color. Uh, she has a number of other ethnic diversities that I don't have. She has a different field of education, but we're writing a book on humanism for humanist chaplains in Canada. And her point of view is so important to balance mine. Even though I think I've read a lot and I'm not real biased because I've worked really hard on myself. She just says, what did you just say? And I need that, but I have to have a thick skin to be able to write with somebody so different. So it follows your concept that's on, on getting a mentor. Yep. And in this case, it's a co-author who really balances out my perspective. And you, you know, you need to trust others and you can't do this with somebody you don't trust. So you have to have a level of trust so that you can cooperate and learn from one another. Well, Afsana, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Yeah, uh, it was, you. you were lovely and it was really thought provoking and engaging. I mean, I, I feel like I learned a lot about myself in the process. I'm so glad, it's so that's so the that's, goal. That's always good. We're um, all learners. I want to thank everybody who joined us today. Again, this is uh, the Lunch and Learn for the International Humanistic Management Association. I included a link in there about membership. So if you're enjoying these sessions, we'd love you to join the association. And there's a link to the membership website um, in the links in the chat box. So thank you once again for uh, joining us.